Hey, I'm Matt Lowndes, live here at LTV, and this is Ask the Supervisor with Town Supervisor Peter Van Skoriak. It's been two weeks since our last show, and today is Monday, September 13th, and I'm here with East Hampton Town Supervisor Peter Van Skoriak. Peter, how are you doing today? I'm doing great, Matt. Good to see you again. Yeah, beautiful day out here in uh, East Hampton. Uh, I figured today we'd start off a little different. It was the 20th anniversary of 9-11 this past weekend. And I figured the easiest way to talk about it is where were you on 9-11, Peter? You know, 9-11 was one of those events um, where I think people recall where they were. It was such a catastrophic day and such a terrible terrible time. Um, I was actually, I, I had gotten up in the morning and I was going to see a client uh, to pick up a check for final payment on a job that I'd done, residential construction business I was were running. Uh, and I knocked on the door and the woman answered the door and she says, oh my gosh, come in quick and look. It looks like a plane hit the World Trade Center. And they thought it was like a little small passing, you know, a prop plane that had hit it initially. Uh, and while I was watching the coverage, I saw the other plane hit the other tower. And it was obvious that this was no accident, that this was uh, somehow a planned attack with a you know, suicide mission. And it was a large commercial airliner. And, you know, from, from that point, you know, the, the horror on, you know, unraveled and uh i had i went from that job location to another job i was doing in montauk where we were actively building and uh an addition on a house there and um uh, and when i got there the woman was just absolutely in tears and crying and uh because many of the people uh that she knew had sons and daughters or friends that worked in those trade center buildings and she was extremely distraught and uh i remember it's just a stunningly clear blue day uh that was just punctuated with you know the screams of horror uh coming from the house as she got further coverage and the buildings collapsed and you know it was just a horrific day well thank you for sharing uh your experience um there's a very good article in the East Hampton Star uh, for, from Chief, Chief of the Police, Michael Sarlo, on how the town helped out the next two days and, and really weeks after 9-11 heading into New York City. So uh, if you're at home, you have a chance, you can go read that at the East Hampton Star online. Uh, let's move on to what seems to be a rising action in COVID cases in Suffolk County. Um, I told you my numbers before earlier, but you have more specific numbers that you can talk about as far as Suffolk County goes. And uh, yeah, so what's the latest that you've heard, especially from the town sites in East Hampton and uh, Montauk? Right. So we've been uh, very concerned with the rapid increase in the number of positive cases within the township. Uh, we got the first inkling of that uh, when we got reports back from the uh, medical company that does testing at the town's location here at town hall and they also have another testing location in montauk on town property and uh those rates had gone from you know single digits to up to you know 12 and 13 percent positivity rates of delta variant uh, within a matter of a couple of weeks um, based on that and numbers we were getting from suffolk county health department um, you know, we, we decided to forego in-person meetings again uh, with the, you know, uh, rationalization that uh, we could continue to have those meetings, albeit remote, and people could still participate without putting anyone at risk for transmission. You know, we're right at a point where kids are going back to school. It's really critically important that the schools open and kids be able to be educated in person. There's really no substitute for that. It's important for their mental health and development and uh, their education that they have in-person, um, you know, schooling. So, you know, children under 12 are not yet vaccinated. So we really thought it's important to, um, you know, reaffirm to the community that this is very serious and they should continue to have precautions. Even if you've been vaccinated, 
you could still contract the disease and you know transmit it to someone else who maybe isn't vaccinated and that includes school children under 12 so we ask that when you're indoors uh, with the public if you're out shopping or whatever it is that you go ahead and wear that mask that is a mandate within town hall town facilities to wear a mask and uh, we've gone back to virtual meetings for the time being we'll continue to monitor the infection rates and as soon as we feel that you know we're we're going back the other direction and that it's safe to do so we'll of course reinstate in-person meetings yeah it's definitely been um one very interesting past few weeks it really did go from very low numbers to out of nowhere, uh, three, four, five percent. So it's it's definitely something to keep an eye on and to pay attention and wear your masks when you can, uh, even if you're just going to the supermarket. It's a good yeah. thing to do. Just for an example, um, the week ending, uh, the testing ended uh, nine five September fifth. We had thirty six increase in uh, number of reported positive cases in town. The following week, we had fifty three for a total of 89 uh, cases positive just in you know a very short period of time uh, that's only slightly lower than the numbers we had in march we had 96 cases in march and this is also the delta variant so it's spreading you know much more easily and uh, rapidly and in some cases uh, you know it's affecting people of younger ages than the previous variant did yeah, so definitely stay on top of it. Wash your hands. Go back to uh, being a little bit extra precautious out there. And um, let's move on to a new topic. And remember, you could call in, dial in 609-663-0574 with any of your questions for Supervisor Peter Van Skorek. So feel free to call in. Uh, you guys have a meeting tomorrow at 11 a.m. Any uh, hot topics you're ready to talk about or same things as usual as far as airport cell tower uh, so uh i'm sure we'll get public comment um that could be any number of different topics uh but we'll be discussing on our agenda new york stretch, stretch energy code okay. basically that is an update to the town's adopted uh energy efficiency code that we currently have uh, and uh, we'll have a discussion uh, led by Hugh King, which is the, who is the uh, chair of the ethics board, discussion about uh, potential amendment to the ethics law, uh, Montauk skate park renovation design. That's a project um, that David Lees is spearheading uh, at the town's Montauk uh, skate park. Uh, that that skate park is beloved by the community, and we're looking to expand it and give more opportunities. To various levels of skateboarders uh, from beginner right up to you know expert right now you know there's like the swimming pool bowl which is more of a expert uh, advanced intermediate type of a situation and we want to just have more amenities there and expand that park so more people can can enjoy it there's been a lot of support from the community we've had some really major donations uh, and it's just a great effort and you know, uh, the local surf community has kind of gotten involved with it as well because, you know, it's basically land surfing, if you will. Um, and you don't require waves. When, when the ocean's flat, you can go practice some skills and have some fun riding your board at skate park. Uh, we'll get an update from our land management department on southern pine beetle. Uh, this is a species that didn't used to be able to survive here because of our colder winters. As uh, the climate has changed now, um, they have made their way up uh, to the mid-Atlantic and to us. And uh, you know, you may recall that we haven't had a lot of uh, weather that would provide ice skating in the winter. You would really need temperatures below 13 degrees for a somewhat sustained period of time to kill off these beetles. And we haven't had that. They've really devastated the pitch pine forests that we have um, in the Pine Barrens uh, throughout much of Northwest Woods. We've lost tens of thousands of trees to the pine beetles. So we'll get an update on efforts to both uh, slow that spread and uh, make the public aware that if they see trees that are starting to be affected, they really uh, can take some steps to help prevent spread. The town has been waiving the dump fees for 
that debris that is uh, removed from a property. Um, and I think we'll continue doing that for the, at least the time being. <clears throat> so those are the agenda items for tomorrow. Now, uh, what does a beetle down tree look like? Did, uh, what would one look for it to notice that their tree has been attacked by these beetles? So the first thing that happens is these, these are tiny little beetles. They're really smaller, they're about half the size of a grain of rice, about half a grain of rice. And they're, they're black. They uh, bore in through the bark of the tree. And as they bore in, the tree's response is to put out sap. And between their burrowing and the tree sap, they'll, they'll, you'll see these little like orangey kind of popcorn shaped uh, bits of um, pitch that are on the bark. And there could be multiple uh, of these. Um, there is another type of beetle that is indigenous called the turpentine beetle. And oftentimes they'll attack the tree in the lower two to six foot off the ground. Um, and they have a similar effect, although there's much more sap that comes out because these are bigger beetles. Um, if you have any questions about whether or not a tree is infected, you can call land management department and they will come and inspect your trees for free, mark any trees that are infected. Uh, the, the next sign is you'll see the yellowing of the needles in the tree. Uh, often the entire tree will start turning yellow and then ultimately orange as the needles die. And at that point, usually you're in stage four and the beetle larva uh, ha are hatching out and moving out to the next tree. They seem to orient to vertical um, trunks and uh, they're not very good flyers, so they don't travel very far. So if you can get ahead of them and uh, create a buffer, generally that will su suppress uh, the spread. It's really like a slow burning fire. It, it can go through an entire forest if left unchecked. Very interesting. I had no idea about any of that. Um, while we're on the topic of animals and what to do about them out here, one thing everyone always talks about here is the deer population and coming into going into the fall it's we're eventually going to change the clocks again it's going to get darker do we have any plans for, I, I don't even know if we're at a normal deer population too high but everyone always talks about it as if it is too high is there any plans for to, to do anything with the deer or we're still just gonna let nature do its thing well you know i guess the first thing to say is um if we were going to let nature do its thing there would be predators that that could keep that population in check. The wolves and bears and mountain lions and all of those, of course, have been eradicated from Long Island and, and much of the country. Um, with, uh, with the deer population, we have seen an uptick. And, you know, I think this past year, there were 610 documented collisions with deer within the township. That's up from the previous year of 546, which is up from the previous year. So we're seeing this you know, expanding number. Um, I think we have more traffic, so that could be a cause as well, but uh, automobiles seem to be the number one predator on the species at this point. We've had a number of naturalists and forestry people review the town's forest lands. And uh, the consensus is that the deer have overbrowsed the understory, and in many cases, just absolutely denuded uh, some of the natural places within the township um, without any predators to keep the population in check. They will continue to, to eat whatever is available. A lot of woodland areas are wide open now, <laughs> where 30 years ago, you couldn't see more than 25 or 30 yards at most. Now you can see into the woods 100, 150, 200 yards in some cases because that understory is completely gone. Why is that important? Well, there's so many other species that rely on that understory. There's a lot of ground nesting birds. We've seen certain populations of ground nesting birds decline significantly. Um, it's just upsetting the entire ecosystem. In some places, the woodlands, uh, hillsides are starting to erode because there's no vegetation left to hold them. And in many of our town preserves, there are no trees smaller than one inch caliper, one inch in diameter to be found anywhere, which means that there's not going to be the succession 
of new trees to uh, have within the forest. And eventually as the older trees die and they're not being replaced, um, it will likely go more towards a grassland or shrub type of uh, ecosystem. So I could be wrong, but could we consider a cull or a desterilization of the deer? I know that when I was in high school, it almost happened. And then there was an injunction last second. I don't know if you were on the board back then, but is that something the town's considered or not really? So I would say that deer calls are highly controversial. Yeah. Um, you know, a lot of people have very strong feelings about deer one way or the other. Some people think we should have a call that they're just way overpopulated, that they're a hazard, that they, you know, eat their, their vegetables, they eat their, eat everything. And that the only way you can grow anything here anymore is to have a deer fence. If you want to grow something other than what deer don't eat. Um, and then other people, you know, feel very strongly that, you know, these are sentient beings and, you know, that they have a right to be here. Uh, and, you know, that's, um, that it's wrong to, to kill animals because there's not a need. Um, I know that, I know that historically, and to this day, there are a number of people in town who actually supplement their, their annual food, uh, stores with venison. Uh, that's not, uh, it might be surprising to some people, especially maybe some of our new arrivals, but this is something that's been done and traditionally been done. And, uh, you know, the town does allow hunting on uh, town property, certain town properties under certain criteria and on certain private property. The State Department of Environmental Conservation has recognized um, the threat of overpopulation and its impact on so many other species. And they have increased or made uh, decreased the restrictions and expanded hunting seasons uh, and whatnot in an effort to try to balance out the population. Uh, again, the primary predator of deer right now is, is uh, automobile. Uh, there is some hunting that occurs, but I think the number of hunters has probably declined somewhat over the years. So, you know, it's a, it's a thorny issue uh, and one that the town has taken up a number of times. Uh, the last time we took it up, we determined that we would not further restrict hunting at this time because of that issue of uh, population. Well, it's very, uh, it seems like people are always talking about a deer accident that happened around the corner of their house. But uh, yeah, like I said, this, this shows more about information. So thank you for letting me know about the updates in that. Um, it is interesting to know that over a three-year stretch, it has gone up each year in accidents. Uh, moving on to the next topic is the large truck ban on the corner of Collins Avenue, I believe, in East Hampton. Can, can you go over that? Sure. You know, um, the, the trestles that are in the village for the LIRR at both mm-hmm. North Main Street and Akabonic were raised, uh, you know, was it a year ago? Maybe it was, two, it was two years ago now, I guess. And, um, you know, subsequent to that, trucks, uh, large track trailer trucks, heavy trucks, uh, were suddenly able to use some of those other roadways where they had never been able to use them before. The roadway at Akabonic Road is, uh, was pretty much a, a residential neighborhood. And so um, there was concern and about this additional new truck traffic coming in that way. And so the town in response to requests from from residents um, had a public hearing about putting a a limit on the size of trucks that could travel on Akabonic Road north of Collins Avenue. That's where the village line is. And uh, so we've had a public hearing, you know, we're adopting that and, uh, you know, it in hopes to try and maintain the status quo of that residential area in that, you know, large trucks would not be traversing uh, that location. Hey, it sounds good for me. I mean, it, it kind of was a mess over there this summer. So personally, I think it makes plenty of sense. Um, 
Moving on, October 26th, it was just announced there's going to be a forum at the East Hampton High School to talk about affordable living for teachers. Uh, this was something I very nonchalantly brought up with you two weeks ago. Um, you've been invited to that. So uh, what is your expectation for that going into that in about a month and a half? Well, I hope we can have a really uh, productive discussion. This is uh, really such a critical issue. Housing affordability uh, has all but vanished for anyone who works. If you didn't already own a home here, uh, there's little chance if you rely on a on the local economy that you'll be able to afford to buy a house now because of uh, there's been such an influx of wealth and, and interest and demand, particularly since the pandemic started. Um, you know, we've seen our population. We talked a little bit last time about the census. The census showed a 34% increase. I think that's that number is probably low. How many of those people end up being year rounders going forward remains to be seen. But the impacts on housing affordability and house value has really been astronomical. And uh, we absolutely have to find ways um, to have uh, people housed in this town, have people who work in the town housed in the town. And that's a challenge across all sectors of the community, whether it be the municipality itself in hiring and retaining staff uh, or the school districts, private businesses, restaurants, you name it. They're all, we're all struggling to find and retain staff. Um, so this issue um, I think will be helped somewhat by uh, Assemblyman Fred Thiel's legislation co-sponsored by Senator Anthony Palumbo, which would institute a half percent transfer tax on home sales, which is paid by the buyer of the property. A half percent would go into a fund that could be used by local towns, much like the CPF fund is used to, for open space and protection of uh, uh, historic structures or water quality. This fund would be dedicated for the purpose of affordable housing, having that funding source in place uh, a year ago, when it was first proposed and sent up to Governor Cuomo to be signed, would have generated about $30 million in the five East End towns to be spent towards addressing the affordable housing crisis. Unfortunately, uh, the governor did not sign the legislation at the time. I'm hopeful that uh, the new governor, Kathy Hochul, will sign that legislation. I've signed on to a letter uh, from Fred Thiel and many other business leaders and elected officials to urge the governor that this is really crucial to the East End particularly, and even more so with COVID. So um, that will, I think that will help having a funding source is important, but there are also other things that, that we have done and continue to do. Um, we have an affordable uh, apartment, accessory apartment law where people can have accessory apartments built in their home or attached to their home. We have a freestanding uh, affordable cottage uh, legislation. If you have three quarters of an acre or more, you'd be eligible to put a small affordable cottage on your property. Uh, we have affordable apartments above stores. That legislation has been in place for some time, but due to the lack of uh, sewers here, uh, many of those properties that would be eligible and ideal for that. And like downtown Montauk, for instance, uh, they can't take advantage of their uh, as of right zoning because there's no sewers there. We're working on, you know, a wastewater uh, plan for downtown Montauk that could, that could help ease uh, some of the affordable apartment issues there as well. Um, so, and we've been active purchasing property. We recently bought 12 acres at, 395 Pantago, just up the road east of Town Hall, uh, for affordable housing. That's working its way through. We had a uh, affordable house, housing overlay district uh, placed on that property. We're working with the housing authority, did an affordable housing overlay at uh, off of Three Mile Harbor Road. Uh, and, you know, there could be another 50 possible units there. So there's a lot going on. But it, it's really a rush to stem the tide of loss of affordable houses within the community. 
many smaller homes are getting torn down and replaced with houses that would not be affordable to a working person going forward. Yeah. So we just have to think of creative ways of addressing this. So I'm, I'm pleased to be invited to participate with the school district. I know they face many of the same issues that the town and other businesses do. I mean, I think it's really important. Uh, I think everybody can agree, regardless of which side you're on, you, you, you want teachers and cops and shop owners and, and workers in your community to be able to live in the community. Um, I, no one's going to argue against that. Uh, it just sounds like need some work upstate, uh, get that bill signed, hopefully, and we could start making some moves uh, into the near future with that. Um, we really only have a few more minutes here. So uh, is there any update on the topic of the year, it seems like, the airport? Well, um, you know, we'll have another airport work session uh, workshop tonight, uh, virtual workshop, 7 p.m. You can go to the town's website and look up um, the links there. Uh, we'll also have another one coming up on the 20th. We're, we've continually engaged the community to get their input about what they think the future of the airport should be. This has been a hotly debated topic for three decades, maybe. And uh, certainly in the last two decades, there's been nothing the town could really do about the airport and how it operates because of the Federal Aviation Administration grant assurances. 20 years ago, town board took grant assurances from the FAA to make improvements at the airport. And that pretty much is hamstrung and tied uh, few, uh, town boards since that date uh, to try and be able to manage the airport. Those grant assurances expire later this month. And uh, this was the first time in two decades that we'll have an opportunity to be able to have significant change uh, w with uh, a topic that I think most everybody agrees that the airport has outgrown uh, its footprint uh, and that that footprint is not, is not really accepted by the community and that we need to figure out um, a way to significantly address the concerns that are raised uh, by the amount of volume of air traffic and the noise created by that air traffic and how it diminishes our quality of life here. Yeah, it's definitely something that uh, everybody should pay attention to is, is what I'll say and make sure you know what you're talking about. It's a very important issue. Like Peter said, this has been going on literally my entire life. Um, so it's definitely something that if you're at home, read up on it because it's a very important issue in our town. Uh, Peter? Unless you have anything else you'd like to bring up, I think we're good to uh, end about a minute early today. Uh, just, uh, I, I got I have just a couple quick announcements. Um, Ocean lifeguards are on duty through this weekend, on this weekend, through the weekend, and then that's it, done for the season. Uh, please uh, be extremely cautious if you do go in the water. Uh, we won't have any guards uh, available. We have a car-free day, car-free Long Island. Uh, take the pledge, sign up at carfreedayli.com. I'll be riding my bike, uh, and I know others will be for taking other forms of transportation, walking, carpooling, whatnot. Um, show that you're environmentally sensitive and find other ways than using car. We have our wireless communications poll results will be presented on the 21st of September. Uh, those are back in from our consultant. And uh, I'm also very pleased to announce that a multi-year lawsuit, the Cam Jemmy suit, suing the town over erosion uh, out at Montauk, near the Montauk jetties, the homeowners there had claimed that the jetty was responsible for erosion to their properties. Uh, ultimately, the town has prevailed and the courts have sided with the town. The jetties were constructed by the Army Corps of Engineers and the town had uh, no ability to uh, affect them and therefore that and for several other reasons the courts have found uh, that East Hampton is not responsible and liable so that was a major victory for us and uh, that's really all I have for now. Yeah no that's that's great news for the town uh, winning that was very important and uh, th there's no update on the uh, truck beach situation with the injunction that came in in June or? Yeah there's no there other than that there's ongoing discovery uh, that's yeah. been requested by the plaintiffs. And, um, you know, so we're, it's winding its way through the court. We're, we're, we're appealing that decision, obviously. 
and uh, stated multiple times that if we don't prevail in court, that uh, we have other options such as condemnation, eminent domain, to ensure that the public's rights of access uh, continue as they have for hundreds of years. Awesome. Uh, Peter, thank you so much. Matt Chapman in the uh, control room, thank you so much. And to uh, everyone at home, thank you for watching and listening. You can come back with us next Monday at 5 o'clock. Peter Van Scoriak's next uh, meeting will be tomorrow at 11 a.m., so you could tune in here on Channel 22. Uh, thank you, and have a great day, everyone. Thanks, Matt. Stay safe and be well, everyone. You too.